Madam President. The Senator from Ohio. Thank you, Madam President. I ask uh, unanimous consent to dispense with the quorum. Without objection. Thank you, Madam President. I, I rise to, today to urge the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. In 1994, this very important law became law. It was groundbreaking for women, for law enforcement, for local advocacy organizations who received the resources they net needed to better protect victims of abuse. It empowered us to combat domestic and dating violence and to prevent sexual assault and stalking. The Violence Against Women Act has improved the criminal justice system's ability to keep victims safe and to hold perpetrators accountable. It's been a valuable tool for so many women, so many children, so many families, and law enforcement to make sure that we can keep people safe. It's vital that we, that we ensure that these services remain intact. Last year, the law expired. Critical efforts that help women and their children protect themselves from domestic violence and stalking and now cyber threats continue only on a short-term basis. As a husband, as a father of three daughters and a daughter-in-law, and as a United States Senator, I find any further delay of reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act to be simply unacceptable. Our mothers, our sisters, our daughters deserve more protection and security and less of the political bickering. In 2011, there were 38,000 38, reported cases of domestic violence in Ohio. Of course, many, many more than that, thousands more, we think, that went unreported. Women live, as do children, with fear and pain. These women live with the fear and pain of their partner's physical and emotional abuse. It's because of the Violence Against Women Act that they have somewhere to turn. It's because of that law that when they do, they have the help to escape violent relationships and the support to seek legal representation when they need to. It's why authorizing the Violence Against Women Act is so important. Women's shelters, domestic violence centers clearly would have trouble existing without this law. These are the very organizations that connect women with legal help, emergency housing, transportation, in lock services. They help with primary prevention programs so children grow up learning the importance of healthy and safe relationships. And the Violence Against Women Act is about assisting law enforcement officials who place themselves in danger when they investigate and prosecute cases of abuse and violence. Reauthorizing the Violence Against Women Act would invest in state grant programs like the grants to encourage arrest policies and enforcement protection order programs that help law enforcement respond to assault crimes. And the bill provides tools for law enforcement, victim service providers, and court personnel to identify better and manage high-risk offenders and prevent domestic violence homicides. Reauthorizing the Violence Against Women Act is long overdue. It's time to stand up for women in this country so they're no longer subject to neglect and abuse in the laws in action. I urge my Senate colleagues to reauthorize, finally, after the opposition, opposition I don't even understand from a number of my most conservative colleagues, how important it is to reauthorize one of the most important pieces of legislation affecting women in our country. Uh, Madam President, I uh, recognize, I, I suggest the absence of a clerk. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
President. The Senator from Alabama. I would ask that the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Madam President, my friend and colleague, Senator Conrad, had said earlier this morning, uh, protesting a bit, that uh, he never said we would have a markup in the budget committee, to mark up a budget as required by law. Uh, but that was what I understood. I'm not here to argue the details of it, but. He said publicly, I understood it, that he was going to have a markup. Uh, our people were working on as many as 80 amendments. Uh, I was working on amendments, uh, key health care amendments. At the time, I heard the senator was having a press conference, and we turned it on, and he basically said, we're not going to have a markup. He said, well, it was a markup. We started a markup. Uh, we had opening statements, and I offered a bill but we just didn't have votes, no amendments, no final vote to passage. Didn't ask a single member of the Democratic uh, team on the budget committee to vote for or against anything. And that's how it happened. Um, I, I, I'm not accusing him of deliberately misleading me. What I would just say is I thought what he told me, we were going to have a markup. And a markup means uh, the chairman lays down the chairman's mark. It's marked up with amendments. Others can offer to substitutes, and you vote. And members of the United States of America, citizens, can hold us accountable for what we do. And if they don't like what we do, they vote us out of office. And they've been pretty good at that in recent years. A couple of times they whacked the Republicans. Last time they whacked the, whacked the big spending Democrats in 2010. So, I mean, that's what America's all about. We're accountable. But there's no ability, need, or right to avoid responsibility for the critical issues of America. So I just want to say that. Let me tell you what happened. And this is no mystery here. There's no mystery here. This started three years ago when the Senate Budget Committee, Senator Conrad was chairman, moved out a budget. But the majority leader, Senator Reid, decided it was going to be uncomfortable to vote on that budget. Now, the United States Code requires that by April 1st, the Budget Committee produce a budget, 
and by April 15th is voted on the floor. The congressmen and senators who passed the Budget Act in 1974 that did that because we weren't having budgets move promptly and on time, they laid out how it should be conducted. Uh, they didn't put down that you lose your pay if you don't produce a budget. They didn't put down you go to jail if you violate the statute. They just said there's, you should do it. So there's no penalty in the code. Senator Reid blocked the budget from coming to the floor three years ago. Then last year, despite the code requiring uh, that we have a budget, uh, Senator Reid decided and his Democratic colleagues decided they didn't want to have a budget even in committee. And they blocked it in committee. There was no budget in committee as the law required. No budget brought to the floor except Senator McConnell forced a few votes, but without the normal debate that you have on a budget process as it moves through the Senate. So I, well, what was going to happen this year? Well, what happened this year? Uh, Senator Conrad, not going to be running again, proud of his service on the budget committee, uh, served on the Erskine Bowl, Simpson Fiscal Commission, the uh, Gang of Six he was involved in. He had some ideas. He wanted to do what the law said, I think. So I think he was wanting to bring forth a budget. At least the last thing he did, he was going to comply with the law. At least that's what I thought. So he got started. We were prepared. And on the eve of the uh, hearing uh, to mark up a budget, we were told, well, we were going to have not a normal markup, but a markup in which we wouldn't vote. And you get to have opening statements. Everybody could. And then you could, uh, he would lay down the mark, but nobody would vote for it or any other amendment or any other substitute mark. So uh, I think that's a pretty sad thing. The reason the Congress in, in 1974 passed the Budget Act is because Congress recognized they were not fulfilling a fundamental responsibility of good government, and that is the largest entity in the world, the entity that spends more money than any other government agency or so forth in the world, the United States of America, ought to lay out in advance its plan for spending its money. Don't you think? That is so basic. And so it required it, and, and, and usually uh, pretty much that's happened, uh, at least with regard to committee work. I would just say this. It said we haven't produced budgets many, many times. We don't produce budgets in election years, they say. Well, there have been times in election years that budgets haven't passed and been reconciled with the House. That's, uh, but there's been other years it hadn't happened also. But I've never known in the 15 years I've been in the Senate, other than these three years, that the budget committee didn't move a budget. The budget committee has always managed to at least move forward. And usually, in every year, we've had votes on the floor, virtually every year. Um, and so I, I, I think this is all miscommunication. And uh, it's, it's a concern to me. So the question is, what we need to ask, what do the American people need to ask, why don't you bring up a budget? Why don't you have a budget? Well, there have been several excuses in the last three years why not to have a budget. Senator Durbin, uh, Speaker Pelosi, uh, Jack Lew recently, uh, Chief of Staff at the White House, former Director of OMB, who ought to know better, said on television, well, you can filibuster a budget, and we can't have a budget because you can filibuster it. Wrong. You can't filibuster a budget. The Budget Act passed in 1974 was designed to make sure we pass the budget. It's passed with a simple majority. You're guaranteed 50 hours of debate, and then you have a vote. But in that 50 hours of debate, you can offer amendments. So it can't be filibustered. That's a bogus excuse. So that's not the real reason, is it? Well, they said 
we had the Budget Control Act last summer, and that takes care of it. We don't need a budget. Wrong. If it's a Budget Control Act is the excuse, why didn't we have a budget last year before the Budget Control Act passed? Why didn't we have one the year before that? That wasn't an election. Uh, last year wasn't an election year. Why? The Budget Control Act is not the reason they didn't bring up a budget. It wasn't the reason they didn't bring up a budget last year and the year before because we didn't have a budget, act, budget Control Act last year or the year before and a budget wasn't brought up. It wasn't brought up for other reasons. Uh, this is the code book, United States Code annotated, where the Budget Control Act is and requires us to pass a budget out of committee by April 1st. So, if the Budget Control Act said we didn't have a, need to have a budget, why did the President submit a budget this year? He submitted a budget. At the Budget Control Act, it was passed last summer, obviated the need for a budget. Why did Congressman Ryan and the Republican House lay out a historic budget that would change the debt course of America, put us on a path to prosperity and not decline. Why did they do it? And there were six other budgets offered in the House, some by Democrats, some by a bipartisan group, and some by conservative Republicans. But the Ryan budget passed. And the others were voted on, too. Why did they go through that process if the Budget Control Act eliminated the need for a budget? So it's not the reason. Oh, they said we can't have a budget during an election year. Ooh, now that's getting close to being a value. What does that mean? Well, we don't want to vote on tough financial issues with an election upcoming, do we? Somebody might know how we voted. They might not be happy with it. They might vote us out of office. And the last thing we want to do is to be voted out of office. We don't want to be held accountable. We don't want the American people to know what we're doing. We want to allow the debt to continue year after year without taking any leadership or action to change it. Now that's getting close to the matter. Senator Conrad said, well, well, we may reconvene the committee after the election, but for sure we don't want to bring it up before the election. Now, I've, I've got to tell you, in this town, the, 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 the media, uh, old hands around Washington, lobbyists, uh, political gurus, they probably think that's clever. And they say it's clever sometimes on TV. Oh, Senator Reid didn't want to bring up a budget because his people would have to vote. That's good politics, they would say. Senator Reid said we're not going to bring up a budget last year because it would be foolish to bring up a budget. Foolish for the United States of America to have a budget at a time when the debt is the greatest threat to our future of any other thing that's out there. It dwarfs any other danger our nation faces is our surging debt. And it's foolish to have a budget? No, he wasn't saying it's foolish to have a budget. It was foolish, he was basically saying, for we Democrats to lay out a plan on how we're going to spend the nation's money because we're going to propose big tax increases in our plan if we put one out there, and they're not going to like it. The great unwashed out here, this uh, Tea Party people, they might get angry with us if they found out how much taxes we're going to increase, how little spending is going to be cut in our budget. That's what he meant, it's foolish. It was politically foolish, not substantively foolish. And we were at this committee, uh, so-called 
faux markup, I call it, yesterday, and the Democratic members speaking, and you would have thought they were serving the nation's interest by not having a vote. Oh, you know, this is, well, we, we're going to talk about this, and they, we should set, talk about so we can begin to make plans for next year, next year, next year. We've gone three years without a budget. They were serving the national interest. All that was really was rhetoric. The interest they were serving was a political interest, and the political interest was not to have to vote and be held accountable because the president's budget is so irresponsible. It's so irresponsible. I offered it last year. Senator McConnell called it up and got a vote on it. Uh, we didn't get to debate it, but it called up for, was able to force a vote 97 to 0 against the president's budget. Every Democrat voted against the president's budget last year. Just earlier this year, the president's budget for this year was brought up in the House. It went down 414 to 0. Then they brought up Congressman Ryan's budget here in the Senate. And all our Democrat colleagues voted against that because, oh, you know, it cuts spending and doesn't raise enough taxes. They voted against it, but they didn't say what they would do. They brought up Senator Toomey's budget, balanced the budget in 10 years last year. He's got one that would bounce maybe even sooner this year. A tough thing to do, but he's got a budget that would do that. And it was brought up on the floor of the Senate and every Democratic vote against that. So with regard to budgets last year, what happened? Our Democratic colleagues voted against the president's budget. They voted against the Toomey budget. They voted against the Ryan budget. They voted against the Rand Paul budget. And they didn't vote for anything. They didn't go on record for anything because they don't have the courage or the coherence or the willingness to agree on a vision for America. That's why it's that simple. You can spin all this any way you want to, but the Democratic majority in this Senate is incapable of uniting behind a plan that the American people would see as credible. They would change our dangerous debt path. Alan uh, Simpson, senator, former senator, and uh, Erskine Bowles, former chief of staff to President Clinton, chaired the Obama commission. He appointed them to the commission, to have a debt commission. They told us this nation has never faced a more predictable financial crisis. And they were talking about the surge in debt. And I think that's true. I think the needle is in the danger zone. Our debt to GDP is now over 100%. Our total gross debt is greater than the entire gross domestic product of our country. Our debt per capita is greater than Europe's. Our debt per capita is greater than Greece. Our debt per capita is $44,000, and under the president's 10-year budget, it would go to $75,000 per person, greater than Europe, which is in the financial crisis today. We have some unique advantages now, but we could lose those. We're heading to a crisis unless we change path. And I'm so disappointed in the president. This is the, the leader of the nation. What does he do? Not only does he not lay forth a credible plan for the future, he attacks Congressman Ron, invites him to come sit down in a meeting, and then attacks him, basically, right there, uh, while he says he wants to have a bipartisan plan to uh, change America. So we need to make some tough decisions a lot of tough decisions. They are not going to be easy. When your debt is about 37%, that we borrow 37 to 40 cents of every dollar we spend. Year, last year we were taking in 3,007, we were taking in 2,200 billion dollars and spending $3,700 billion. I know people think this is not true. I'm telling you it's true. And that's why Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives, acknowledge we're on the wrong path. 
saw the um, budget that Senator Reed, uh, Senator Conrad, laid down, but none of his, uh, his colleagues voted for it. He didn't vote for it either. But the, the budget he laid down yesterday uh, would not cut any spending over the uh, agreement on the Budget Control Act next year. After the Budget Control Act passed, we were projecting to spend $44 trillion over 10 years on the Senator Conrad's budget. We spend $44 trillion over 10 years. But he claimed he was going to reduce deficits. How? $2.6 trillion in new taxes. No cuts, $2.6 trillion in new taxes. No wonder they don't want to have it out here on the floor where we can be talked about and amendments can be offered and the American people could know what's in it. That's no way to solve our nation's problem. And the president goes around saying we need the Buffett tax. You know the Buffett tax and how horrible it is that people don't see that as a solution to our problems when in fact it would raise four billion dollars a year. And this year our deficit is projected to be again one thousand three hundred billion dollars. And this Buffett tax is going to raise four? I mean how irresponsible is that? Is this all we're getting from the other side? Tax all companies, raise the Buffett tax, all of it's no, there's no reality here. So I, what I believe is this. A budget lays out a comprehensive plan. It lays out a plan for 10 years. And we got some smart people around here, and they can add, the, uh, add up the numbers. And they'll know what that budget raises taxes and how little it may be cutting of spending and how much debt we'll be accumulating each and every year in the years to come. How much the interest, that's one of the things the Congressional Budget Office tells us, how much interest on our debt we'll pay each year. And you could ask uh, Congressman Ryan, how much interest are you going to have to be paying on your debt over the next 10 years? You could ask Senator Conrad, Senator Reid, how much interest will your budget call us to pay? On, pay? For example, President Obama's budget. Last year we paid $240 billion in interest on the debt of the United States. According to the Congressional Budget Office, they cons they've analyzed the numbers and calculated that at the end of the 10th year, we would pay $940 billion in interest in one year. The Federal Highway Program, we, we came up short, I thought, $2 billion to meet the budget this year for the highways. That's $40 billion. Federal Aid to Education, $100 the Defense Department, base budget, uh, $540 billion. Interest that would be the fastest growing item in the federal budget based on the fact that we're running up virtually trillion dollar deficits for the rest of the decade. And also the President's budget fails to alter the debt course in the future. Congressman Rhines does. It deals with the surging entitlements at least uh, uh, the ones that can be. Uh, you can't deal with Social Security in a budget by law, but you can deal with Medicare and Medicaid and other surging entitlement programs that have to be brought on, under some sort of uh, stable uh, uh, control so they don't go bankrupt. And he dealt with that, but the President doesn't deal with that in any realistic way. And he's failed to lay out a plan. And I guess what I'm saying, I'm just frustrated this morning on to hear that it somehow our colleagues are aggrieved that they did not get, uh, that, that, that we felt that we should have had a markup on the budget. We didn't get one. And the reason we didn't get one is because a decision has been made in the highest councils of the majority party of the United States Senate that they do not want to be held accountable for the votes necessary 
to put our country on a sound path. And I'm very disappointed about it, and that's the uh, bottom line. Uh, hopefully, as time goes by, uh, we can uh, uh, come together and work together uh, to pass a plan for America, including tax reform, that would put us on the right path. That certainly is what is needed. And uh, I would just say, though, that a budget can be passed on a party-line basis. And it has been done many times in the past because particularly the majority party has a responsibility, in my view, to lay out its vision for the country. And the biggest part of that vision is where they intend to spend the taxpayers' money. And rather than... I can't imagine that they would want to go to the American people, act, ask for higher taxes when they refuse to comply with the plain statutory law that says they should have a budget to tell where that money is going to be spent. If you won't tell the American people where you're going to spend the money, how much debt you're going to run up, how much spending you're going to cut or not cut, then I don't think the American people ought to send another dime to this place. Not another dime. And that's why the polling numbers show we're in such sad shape. Madam President, I thank the chair and would yield the floor. Madam President. The Senator from Massachusetts. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, all of us who uh, work here in the United States Senate who are privileged to serve as senators know on a personal level that we are always only as good as our staff and the staff work that we're privileged to have uh, from them. Uh, I think every senator is enormously grateful for the hours uh, that uh, all of our staffs invest to help us do our work. And oftentimes that means missing weekends, deferring, delaying, or playing canceling vacations, working away on a beautiful Saturday morning when other people are out and about. Uh, and I'm sure that the best of them would readily admit that they'd rather be spending their time somewhere other than perhaps the Russell Senate office building. That's why uh, today I mark a very bittersweet transition on my team. Because tomorrow is Kathy Kerrigan's last day on my Senate staff as having been confirmed at the end of the last work period, she is leaving the uh, United States Senate to serve as a judge on the tax court, the United States tax court. And that is the capstone of an already distinguished life spent in public service. As proud as I am to have her go and serve on the tax court, Madam President, it is really difficult to imagine uh, my office without her. Uh, she's had the title of tax counsel, but she really was a lot more than that. Uh, the chairman of the Finance Committee, Max Baucus, or my colleague, uh, from Massachusetts in the House, uh, Kathy's old boss, Richie Neal, all know better than anyone just how much on almost every single issue in the Congress, uh, it always somehow comes to be a tax issue and uh, a finance committee issue. So for six years, Kathy has been my indispensable utility player. It didn't matter if it was on health reform, climate change, energy, infrastructure, super committee, uh, if it was anything that I was working on with a fairly high level of focus, uh, you can bet that Kathy was there. And I can tell you, she wasn't just there, she was invariably the indispensable player. Uh, I don't know if she'll like it, but I would say that time she was a wonk's wonk. Uh, she knew the finance committee brilliantly, uh, and sometimes 
I had to struggle to follow uh, Kathy because Kathy talked tax, and tax is a different language. Uh, she was almost a charter member of the very unique clique of the Finance Committee staffers, and, and Max Baucus knows what I'm talking about from his staff director, Russ Sullivan. They actually had their own annual tax prom, and that's how exclusive a bunch that they are, and there are a lot of us who are a little scared to think of what a tax prom looks like. Uh, I once said it was probably a prom for people who didn't go to their own proms once upon a time, but in fact, it is a party for the smartest, most detail-oriented, hardest working staffers that the Senate has because they are always in the middle of everything around here, and boy, do they deliver. And that's really where Kathy was in her element, diving into the minutiae of issues, uh, crystal balling legislation better than just about anybody that I've ever worked with. I'll tell you, if she'd chosen the Navy instead of the Finance Committee, uh, we would be here today saluting Admiral Kerrigan. She comes to an issue always armed with facts. She has always thought through every question that a senator or anybody else might ask about a particular issue. And she is driven to get the job done, and she always did. On health care, she was a phenomenal thinker as we worked through the Finance Committee issues and the funding mechanisms. Last summer, when she was nominated for the court, uh, but then, nevertheless, I asked her to serve on the Deficit Committee, and she promised to stay until the work was done. And I, I, I cannot emphasize how valuable she was there also, Madam President. On the Joint Select Committee, uh, there were many times when committee members from both parties would ask if Kathy could join a meeting. That's a sign of respect and of ability. She was someone who quietly, head down, did the work, and let the work try to find a way towards a solution. Uh, everything that I admire about her as a public servant is really written into her DNA. I think it's the result of growing up uh, in Springfield, Massachusetts, where her father, Bill Sullivan, served as mayor. Uh, she had a front row view of what it is like in, in public life, of what the demands are, and of what a difference earnest people like her father can make in government people who do the work without worrying about the limelight or who gets the credit. She never lost sight of that through Boston College and Notre Dame Law School and 14 years on Capitol Hill working on tax policy. As much as I admire the special energy that Kathy brought to her job, what I admire most about her is her uh, ability to distinguish between right and wrong, her moral compass that always guided her uh, in her public service. Uh, i just share one quick story before I wrap up, Madam President. Last summer, uh, deadly tornadoes clipped through the hometown, her hometown of Springfield, Massachusetts. And the first thing that Kathy did was obviously to make sure that her parents were safe. But the second thing she did was just get in her car and drive to work immediately. Instead of going home to Massachusetts, she came to work in the Senate on a bright Sunday morning and immediately got busy working on tax disaster legislation to help the people of Springfield, the small businesses, the people who had been impacted. She, she didn't see arcane tax legislation. What she saw were bricks and mortar, lumber and nails, and, and, and lives that had been disrupted. Uh, that's the Kathy Kerrigan that I know. That's the Kathy Kerrigan who I've been privileged to have working with me through some of the most interesting, most grueling, most productive legislative years that I've had the privilege of being part of in the 27 years in the Senate. I will miss her energy, her creativity, the dedication that she brought to my office, but it's good to know, and we will all be reassured by the fact that she will bring those same qualities, heart and head, to the federal bench. She will be a phenomenal tax judge, and she will continue to make her family and her friends in her home state of Massachusetts very proud. Madam President, I suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
Madam President. The Senator from Vermont. Madam President, um, what is the parliamentary situation? The Senate is, uh, we were in a quorum call. Uh, Madam President, I ask consent the call of quorum be dispensed with. Without objection. And Madam President, what is the uh, parliamentary situation? The Senate is considering the motion to proceed to the Violence Against Women's Act. Well, uh, thank you, Madam President. And um, I want to, um, I'm glad we're doing that. I, I want to thank the Majority Leader for moving to proceed to the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. Uh, he made that motion Tuesday afternoon. Now, my hope is it's not going to be necessary to have extended debate or a filibuster or the filing of a cloture petition or delay of several days and a delay two more days, even after more than 60 votes, to bring the debate to a close and proceed to a bill and another vote in the motion to proceed before the Senate permitted to consider this important measure. Um, I expect, Madam President, anybody listening to loss of that whole, whole train, and that's something we senators should think about. American public expects us to vote yes or no, and not maybe. And the longer the delaying motions go on, you're voting maybe. Let's vote yes or no. For almost 18 years, the Violence Against Women Act has been the centerpiece of the federal government's commitment to combat domestic violence and dating violence and sexual assault and stalking. The impact of this landmark law has been remarkable. It's provided life-saving assistance to hundreds of thousands of women and children and men. And I appreciate the fact this has had bipartisan support from the beginning. Senator Crapel and I introduced a reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act last year after months of discussion. We wanted it to be a bipartisan bill, and it is. Now, too often of recent times, the Senate goes through all kinds of delaying moves before they proceed to legislation. Again, as I said, we're American people elect us, expect us to vote yes or no, and not maybe. The delays are big, fat, maybe. But the Violence Against Women Act is a measure that's co-sponsored by 61 measures. Uh, 61 senators, sponsored by Democrats and Republicans and Independents, passed out of the Senate Judiciary Committee in February. So I hope that now Democrats and Republicans and Independents will come together to proceed to consider the bill without delay. And I would hope they step forward, do the right thing, send the message to America. We want the Violence Against Women Act reauthorized. It's an opportunity for the Senate to come together and renew what I believe is a shared commitment among senators to end violence against women. For generations, violence against women in this country was condoned. Too often these insidious crimes were dismissed with a joke or a shrug or that involves somebody else. Rape was too often excused. Domestic violence was tolerated as a family matter. Victims were blamed and humiliated and ignored. They had nowhere to turn. There were no crisis centers. There were no shelters. Far too many women and families were left to fend just for themselves with no help. But the Violence Against Women Act, 18 years ago, has helped to change that. It sent a powerful message that violence against women is a crime. And it's not going to be tolerated no matter where it happens. It transformed the law enforcement response. It provided services to victims all across the country. Now, Madam President, is the time to renew our commitment to these victims by passing this legislation. We need to move forward. We have to reaffirm that ending violence against women is a priority for all Americans. We need to be a beacon to others around the world in this regard. With this effort, we set the standard. We show that America understands equality, 
recognizes human dignity. We're going to fight injustice against the most vulnerable among us. The legislation I introduced with Senator Crapo is drawn from the needs of survivors of domestic and sexual violence. It's based on the recommendations we got from professionals who worked so hard on this. It includes improvements suggested by law enforcement officers across the country as we build on the progress we made in reducing domestic and sexual violence, we make vital improvements responding to remaining unmet needs to better serve the victims of violence. We incorporate the important work that Chairman Akaka, and Senator Murkowski, and the Senate Indian Affairs Committee have been doing to try to respond to the epidemic of domestic and sexual violence in the tribal communities. We increase the focus on effective response to sexual assault. Now, the incidence of domestic violence has fallen since FAWA was first introduced by more than 50 percent. The progress is not yet translated to reducing sexual assault. Incidence of sexual assault remains high, while reporting rates and prosecution rates and conviction rates remain appallingly low. So we face that problem head on. We ensure that funds are allocated to law enforcement and victim service responses to sexual assault. It authorizes support for law enforcement sexual assault training and the reduction of the backlogs of untested rape case kits. You know, in a lot of places, they say, well, we can't test this rape kit for several months. So. Oftentimes, we find the person who did this may come back. So during those several months, they say to the victim, be sure and keep your door locked. Boy, that's a great consolation, isn't it? It's to be able to say, we can test this immediately, and we can go get the person involved. You know, my, my early experience with questions of sexual assault was not as a senator, but as a local prosecutor. And Senator Crapo has been visiting women's shelters and working on these issues for decades as well. His principled bipartisanship should be respected, should be celebrated as being in the best tradition of the Senate, the Senate I came to 37 years ago. At the outset, we consulted to make this bill the best we can. More than a month ago, senators from both parties came forward to urge the Senate to take up and pass the reauthorization, the Violence Against Women Act. The Senate heard that day from Senator Klobuchar, Senator Mikowski, Senator Mikowski, Senator Murray, distinguished presiding officer Senator Hagan, Senator Shaheen, Senator Feinstein, Senator Boxer, who was the author of a House bill in 1990. Eight senators came to the floor to remind us why this bill is important, why it should pass. There's nothing radical or new by saying that all victims, all victims are entitled to services. Now, I've been some of the most horrendous crime scenes you can imagine in my earlier career. I never asked, and certainly none of the police officers there ever asked, whether the victim was a Democrat or Republican or rich or poor or from a minority. So a victim is a victim is a victim. And we should be all helping all victims, not discriminating among them. Now, we know that even though the economy is improving, we have to spend our taxpayer money responsibly. And that's why in this bill, I want senators to know we consolidate 13 programs into four to reduce duplication bureaucratic barriers, cut the authorization level by more than $135 million a year, decrease of 20 percent from the last reauthorization. We have significant accountability provisions, audit requirements, enforcement mechanisms. And I sought to consult with Senator Grassley and others on this, knowing how important these aspects are to them. At our Senate Judiciary Committee, those who opposed the bill were given an opportunity to offer a substitute and other amendments. Those were voted on. Uh, minority view in the Kyle noticed uh, disagreement with the provisions of the bill responding to the crisis of violence against Native women by incorporation of provision for the Save Native Women Act to provide domestic violence jurisdiction. 
or per perpetrators with significant ties to the prosecuting tribes. Opponents have noted their disagreement with the U visa provision requested by law enforcement. Some oppose the provisions intended to ensure against discrimination in services based on sexual orientation or gender identity. Again, I'll say what I've said over and over again. A victim is a victim is a victim. And we shouldn't ask what category they, go, they fall in. If somebody's a victim of violence against women or sexual abuse, we shouldn't ask what category they fall in. I've continued to reach out to those on the other side. If they have other amendments, let's bring them up, let's vote on them. Let's vote this up or down. Don't vote maybe. So I hope we can reach to the leadership on both sides, get a time to get this done. Don't keep holding up legislation that's been endorsed by more than 700 state and national organizations and numerous religious and faith-based organizations and law enforcement. Let's show the Senate won't duck this issue. We'll vote for it or we'll vote against it. Because domestic and sexual violence knows no political party. Its victims are Republican and Democrat, rich and poor, young and old, male and female, gay and straight. Let's pass this without delay. It's a law that saved countless lives. It's an example of what can be done when we work together. So, Madam President, I see my distinguished colleague from Connecticut on the floor. I would yield the floor and ask consent that my full statement be made part of the record. Without objection. Senator from Connecticut. Thank you, Madam President. I want to begin by saluting and thanking the Senator from Vermont for his extraordinary leadership on this issue of the Violence Against Women Act. He has been truly and deservedly a hero in championing a measure that has saved countless lives and prevented the kind of suffering and brutality that we've seen all too often. And I join him in his remarks, and I will be speaking at greater length about the need for this bill in the future. And I rise today on a different subject to introduce a resolution condemning the government of Syria for crimes against humanity. I'm pleased to be joined by Senators Graham, Klobuchar, Kirk, Cardin, Coates, Collins, and McCain in introducing this resolution. And I'm very proud that we have strong bipartisan support and thank in particular Senator Graham for his leadership along with Senator McCain, who repeatedly and consistently on this area of human rights and liberties have stood for basic American principles of democracy and freedom. And I had the great opportunity to visit a number of the Middle Eastern countries with them and my strong support for this kind of resolution really rises from the firsthand views that we were able to have of the results of freedom fighters in Tunisia and Libya and Egypt having an impact on the future of their countries, being on the right side of history as the United States was there and the gratitude of those peoples when they welcomed us to their countries. And I am grateful to Senators McCain and Graham for giving me that opportunity, along with Senator Sessions and Hoven, who accompanied us for their leadership. Crimes against humanity includes acts such as murder, torture, and unlawful punishment and imprisonment when committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack on civilian population. Since peaceful protests began early this year, the Syrian regime has brutalized and savaged its own people leaving thousands dead as it commits horrific crimes against humanity, including the abduction and torture of children. This resolution tells the Syrian people, you are not alone. The American people are with you. 
as you fight for freedom and basic democratic rights, the people of the world are watching. On November 23rd, 2011, the United Nations appointed Independent International Commission of Inquiry on the Syrian Arab Republic expressed grave concern that, quote, crimes against humanity of murder, torture, rape, or other forms of sexual violence, imprisonment, or other severe deprivation of liberty, enforced disappearance of persons, and other inhumane acts have occurred in different locations in Syria since March 2011. The Commission also found, and quoting again, the Syrian Arab Republic bears responsibility for these crimes and violations. Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs Jeffrey Feltman testified before the Committee on Foreign Affairs of the United States Senate that, quote, large numbers of Syrians are living every day under siege deprived of basic necessities, including food, clean water, and medical supplies, and women and children are wounded and dying for lack of treatment. General Mattis, commander of the United States Central Command, for whom I have the strongest and deepest respect, explained before the Senate Armed Services Committee, the Syrian military consider continues to ruthlessly use lethal force with impunity against the Syrian people. In this body, we have not remained silent in the face of this humanitarian disaster. <coughs> Approving on February 17, 2012, Senate Resolution 379, condemning violence by the government of Syria against the Syrian people. <coughs> We've also passed Senate Resolution 391, which I co-sponsored condemning violence by the government of Syria against journalists and expressing the sense of the Senate on freedom of the press in Syria. Now, the world should be inspired by the continuing courage and determination of Syrian protesters standing up and speaking up despite the Syrian military gunning down and bombing down their homes, their businesses, their neighborhoods. I know our nation is at war and rightly weary of intervention abroad. But military intervention is not our only option, not the only means to summon support or step forward in solidarity with freedom fighters in Syria. Nor is military intervention alone sufficient to call forth the world's conscience. Even without military action, we need not abdicate democratic rights and principles that underlie and underpin our own nation's constitutional ethos. One powerful and profound step that this body can take is to bear witness to the atrocities occurring in Syria. More than 9,000 people have died in Syria since these protests began. As Eli Wiesel said, for the dead and the living, we must bear witness. The Syrian thugs that detain and torture children must know that the United States bears witness to their crimes. President Assad, we should say to him, the world is watching and witnessing as you use snipers to target civilians, indiscriminately shell homes and businesses, torture protesters who dare to speak of change. This resolution calls on President Obama to bear witness by using his existing authority. America can and must bear witness by taking and preserving evidence of actions and incidents in Syria that constitute crimes against humanity. And America must bear witness by asking the President's newly created Atrocities Prevention Board to consider crimes against humanity occurring in Syria. These atrocities epitomize the crimes that this prevention board must address. I commend President Obama and Secretary of State Clinton for their work at the United Nations and with our allies to assist the Syrian people, but we should make our own findings about what's occurred in Syria concerning crimes against humanity. We cannot avoid this obligation simply because the results 
may present difficult choices. As Martin Luther King would often remind us, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. If we bear witness today, justice will come closer for the Syrian people. President Assad and the government of Syria, its leaders and senior officials who are responsible for crimes against humanity, will be brought to account and justice for their crimes. I urge my colleagues to join me in supporting this resolution. Thank you, Madam President. And I note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.